Hello and welcome to this course presentation on Dinosaurs in Film. My name is Andreas, I'm a filmmaker and visual effects artist and I've both directed and contributed to a few dinosaur projects myself. But just to show how far back this really goes, this is me and my brother at a dinosaur theme park over 25 years ago. Now first of all let's do a bit of a history lesson. Ever since the birth of cinema, dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures have become a common feature, as well as being an example for showcasing the development of special effects and animation. The first instance of a dinosaur on screen was Gertie the Dinosaur in 1914, created by Winsor McKay, which is also one of the earliest hand-drawn animated films ever created and said to have inspired many of the great animators to follow, including Walt Disney. That very same year, Brute Force by David W. Griffith featured the first live-action dinosaur, in the form of a puppet next to cavemen. Only one year later, Willis O'Brien would become the first to animate dinosaurs using stop-motion animation, uh, the process which involves photographing models frame by frame in order to create the appearance of motion. After his early successes, he would go on to lead the work on a multitude of large productions, including the widely renowned classics The Lost World in 1925. And later on King Kong in 1933. Even Disney himself would have a go at it back in the day with uh, 1940s Fantasia and its Rite of Spring segment, which depicts a prehistoric Earth up until the end of the dinosaur's reign. It would however take another 50 years until dinosaurs made another appearance in a widely known animated feature, with uh, Don Bluth's The Land Before Time in 1988. So, in the meantime, dinosaurs would mainly be featured as monsters or adversaries in live-action films, spearheaded by pioneers such as Willis O'Brien and his protege Ray Harryhausen. The technique and artistry of stop motion would continue to improve and develop, pushing the limits of special effects in a pre-digital era. However, given the financial costs involved with stop motion animation, some films would rather resort to other methods which could be achieved on a smaller budget including puppets or suits. And on occasion even using lizards and crocodiles with rubber prosthetics. Also, it can be noticed that designs and scenarios for dinosaurs would mostly favor stereotypes and inaccurate depictions, which is likely a symptom of the decline in scientific research before the dinosaur renaissance. As a side effect though, Japan's very own Godzilla franchise was born as a reaction to these monster movies. But in 1993, Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park was released in cinemas, featuring both cutting-edge practical effects and computer-generated imagery. The film's technical achievements would help usher in the digital revolution, creating an entire new industry in the business of film, without which many modern classics and popular series would have been impossible to achieve. It was also one of the first productions to implement many scientific theories of the dinosaur renaissance into the portrayal of its dinosaurs. Based on the groundwork that was laid by Jurassic Park, the television documentary Walking with Dinosaurs was released in 1999 by the BBC, pushing the boundaries of visual effects in television and spawning a host of spin-offs and programs inspired by the original series. And to this day, artists continue to advance the craft both practically and digitally in order to bring dinosaurs to the screen as realistic as possible, or as time, resources, or someone's creative vision allows them to. But what steps are taken nowadays to bring a dinosaur to life? For this, let's take a look at an example and use that as our guide. This dinosaur, called City Party, is the main character from a short film that I did a few years ago. And while someone with a keen eye might correctly spot a few errors in this reconstruction, it all does start out from an accurate point of reference. 
the actual skeleton. At the beginning, a large library was put together for reference, like skeletal data, artistic renderings, real-world references, as well as similar examples from other media. Compared to a large movie production or documentary, this would be equivalent to employing conceptual artists in order to create specific designs for the prehistoric characters, as well as have scientific experts come in to guide the initial development. Famously, paleontologist Jack Horner has been credited as a scientific advisor for the Jurassic Park films, and the production of the first film employed various renowned paleoartists as consultants. Another person to highlight would be Stuart Sumida, who, as a paleontologist and anatomist, has consulted many animation and visual effects projects for different studios and film schools around the world. Likewise, conceptual artists can have their own expertise to share. For example, David Krenz is a character designer and animator, as well as a paleoartist, and has worked among other projects on multiple large-scale dinosaur productions throughout his career. With all that preparation, the first step is to build a model based on all the reference gathered. Similar to a practical model, the process is to start simple and then keep refining the surface and detailing it further. This happens either by constructing a wireframe by increasingly adding more points, but also tools that allow to digitally sculpt a surface as if someone was using virtual clay. The surface then gets painted with color maps and other textures, which help define properties of the surface's shading, like small bumps, reflectivity, or light behavior. Although color will of course remain a mystery for the majority of dinosaurs, a good starting point for tones and patterns is to look at existing references in nature and derive something appropriate from there. A common method was to build real maquettes first, as they would often be used on location as a reference for lighting, or for the CG artists later on, and then scan these into the computer with a 3D scanner in order to get a digital model. But with the speed and flexibility of digital tools, it can actually be easier now to create the model in the computer first, and then print it out later if needed. For instance, on Jurassic World, the digital model of the T-Rex created by the visual effects team was sent to the creature department which would build the animatronics, so the T-Rex puppet on set would accurately match the digital version. The next step is building an interior rig, which serves as a representation of the skeleton in order to puppeteer the model. In the days of stop motion, a metal armature was created first as an interior structure, over which the rubber skin was grafted. When using CGI, the rig is the digital equivalent, and in a simplified setup, the wireframe gets locally constrained to the individual bones. The idea is to give an animator as much control over the model as possible within the limited range that the body would allow. In the animation stage, the rigs are brought to life, which is the literal meaning of the term derived from the Latin animatio. Unlike the frame-by-frame -frame work and stop motion, computer animation does benefit from procedures like interpolating movements between poses, controlling the flow of movement and timing, and of course the possibility to perform multiple iterations. Animators, however, do need to possess an understanding of conveying weight and energy in motion, as well as being able to create a distinct performance, regardless of the techniques in use. Phil Tippett and his team, who were originally supposed to animate Jurassic Park's dinosaurs with stop motion, were later actually brought on to work on the CG animation because of their expertise, also counting in that Tippett himself had already worked on a few dinosaur projects, most of them animated in his own garage. Finding the right performance sometimes involves researching movement and behaviors based on approximation, for example by finding a modern-day example as reference to study, or might even require some acting capabilities and simply pretending to be a dinosaur. The next step would be to add organic details like secondary movement in order to help the dinosaur's surface and mass appear to behave more realistically. Looking at this example, you can see the x-ray highlighting the additions such as primitive muscles or the neck reacting to the dinosaur's body movement. But in the early days, that was of much less concern. 
When creating the very first CG creatures, one of the biggest challenges was in fact to keep the models from breaking apart and glitching. But with the continuing advancement of digital technology, increasing attempts were made to add more details. At first, it would start with animating small details by hand or trying to procedurally add in deformations. But around 2000-2001, artists started actually introducing muscles which would bulge and stretch as well as sliding skin. Today's computer-generated creatures, not just dinosaurs, are now fully built with realistic digital anatomy, including actual skeletal structures, muscles, fat, and skin which is fully simulated as a volume in order to replicate the complex interactions of real organic components. The team behind the Walking with Dinosaurs feature film even went as far as creating systems that would scatter individual scales on a dinosaur's body for extra detail. Feathers, however, still remain a technical challenge to this day, as large animation companies often have to develop proprietary systems in order to handle the amount of detail and behavior required, or need to rely on techniques less suitable or harder to control. Now that the dinosaur is fully prepared, the work is far from over, though. Depending on the type of project, the entire environment of course needs to be created as well, if animated, or in the case of a live-action project, enough data collected on location in order to recreate it in the computer. Technical directors both ensure that the digital elements are lit properly and recreate natural phenomena like smoke, fire and water or other kinds of simulations that would be too complicated to animate by hand. And in the end, it is the compositor's job to assemble all the elements, enhance them further and make sure that they all blend together coherently. Now, all you have to do is repeat the process for the amount of shots that you have in your very own project, and that's pretty much it. Still riding the wave of the dinosaur renaissance from several decades before, paleontologists continue to improve our understanding of dinosaurs through research and new discoveries, while artists are pushing limits both creatively and technically in order to improve their depictions of prehistoric life. As explored a little before, there are certain benefits of both parties collaborating together. Frequently, the scientific discoveries and research will directly inspire the creative process of story development, such as fossils capturing moments of the dinosaur's life. One of the more notable examples would be the discovery of Big Al, whose skeletal record of body injuries inspired its own speculative documentary in the form of a biography. With the increasing complexity and realism required, digital artists benefit greatly from the active research and expertise that scientists can offer, as any knowledge into the dinosaur's anatomy will aid in constructing the digital character, and theories on behavior or potential limitations may inform the animation process. Whereas in return science can benefit from the artistic work visualizing said research in a more widely accessible medium, and gain new insight from the challenges that artists had to overcome which is said to have occurred multiple times across various productions. And on their own, artists may become more emboldened to offer up unique creative interpretations, which in turn can fuel critical discussion. Even the tools developed primarily in an artist-driven environment can benefit the scientific process. For instance, when reconstructing the newly discovered remains of Spinosaurus around 2014, the team digitally scanned in the bones and created a digital model, using one of the very same 3D sculpting tools in order to rebuild the skeleton, and fill in the missing pieces with a little bit of carefully guided artistry. And who knows what's to come? Here's to hoping that the collaboration between science and art will continue to be a prosperous one going forward. Thank you all for staying until the end.